education. Good morning, America. This morning, touchdown in Tokyo. President Trump arriving for the start of his 13-day Asia trip with a message of strength. We dominate the sky. We dominate the sea. We dominate the land and space. Teeing up an ambitious agenda, what he hopes to accomplish, and what our new poll says about his approval rating and the loyalty of his base. Spilling secrets. I'm with her! The tell-all new book by former DNC interim chair Donna Brazil. How she reportedly considered removing Hillary Clinton from the Democratic ticket after Clinton's collapse at last year's 9-11 memorial. Who was the candidate that would have replaced her and would it have made a difference in the election? Fraternity death, a pledge at FSU dies after a night of party. They determined the person to be deceased. All attempts to revive the person were unsuccessful. The Pi Kappa Phi frat now suspended on campus. What we're learning about its history of violations. And Alec Baldwin backlash. The actors taking heat for new comments about actress Rose McGowan and her rape claims against Harvey Weinstein. Was it victim blaming? And why Baldwin is now taking a Twitter break. Live from ABC News in New York, this is Good Morning America. Really, really good here. No, no. Anyway, we're talking about something else. Good morning. Uh, Paula's off. Very happy to have Diane Macedo at the desk. You know, you're joining us on the best morning of the year to um, be a morning news anchor. Yes. Because it was fall back overnight. Don't forget to set Actually, your uh, clocks yeah, back. End of daylight saving time. Even Ron Claiborne's in a good mood this morning. Look at him. He's being relative. Relative. It's yeah. all relative. Uh, let's start, though, with the news and the president overseas. He landed in Tokyo a few hours ago. The first stop in a 13-day trip that will take him to five countries. There he is talking to U.S. troops stationed in Japan. He also tweeted out uh, a video of him golfing with the Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, who, by the way, tweeted out his own picture of the outing. Everybody's on social media this morning back here at home. Meanwhile, the president's political problems persist. Look at this new poll from ABC News and The Washington Post showing just 37 percent of Americans approve of Trump's job performance. That's the lowest for any president nine months in office since polling began in 1946. But his support isn't dropping much among his base. Ninety one percent of Trump voters say they would support him again. That's just five percent off of April's number. We have team coverage this morning, and we start with ABC senior White House correspondent Cecilia Vega, who's traveling with the president in Tokyo. Good morning, Cecilia. Hey, Diane, good morning to you. Also in that poll, 67% of Americans say they do not trust President Trump to act responsibly in his handling of North Korea. But the White House aides say North Korea is the president's number one priority on this trip. His goal? To ramp up pressure on Pyongyang. Overnight, President Trump and the First Lady landing in Tokyo, the tarmac packed with troops cheering on their commander-in-chief. The president signed photos of himself before putting on a military bomber jacket at Yokota Air Base. I like this better. You can have my jacket, just... And delivering remarks that set the stage for his five-country diplomatic tour. We dominate the sky. We dominate the sea. We dominate the land and space. A mince no words show of force. He never mentioned North Korea, but he said the U.S. stands ready to fight. No one, no dictator, no regime, and no nation should underestimate ever American resolve. Every once in a while in the past, they underestimated us. It was not pleasant for them, was it? On Air Force One, the president said he will meet with Russia's Vladimir Putin, saying, quote, we want Putin's help on North Korea. He will also sit down with China's Xi Jinping, who recently consolidated power in his Communist Party. Reporters asked President Trump if he was at a disadvantage against Xi's new position of power. He interrupted and said, excuse me, so am I, adding, we're going in with tremendous strength. But before those meetings, a round of golf with Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, a reciprocal invitation after they hit the links earlier this year in Mar-a-Lago. Their bond on full display for the cameras, the two leaders autographing custom hats that said, Donald and Shinzo make alliance even greater. 
And the president and prime minister Abe played nine holes of golf. We're told they did not keep score, but they did talk about North Korea. Now, on the way over here on Air Force One, the president was asked about that grueling schedule, how he's going to manage it, guys. He said, quote, it is grueling, but fortunately, historically, that has not been a problem for me. I will stay fresh. That's a quote, guys. All right. You. Well, you know, you'll be here with them, Cecilia, so we hope you stay fresh as well on your travels. Thanks, Cecilia. And now to the other big political story this morning, the bombshells contained in a new memoir from former DNC chairwoman Donna Brazile. Brazile reportedly considered replacing Hillary Clinton on the top of the Democratic ticket just two months before the election. And ABC's Gloria Riviera is in Washington with that story. Gloria, good morning to you. Good morning, Dan. That is not all. In addition to saying she thought about replacing Hillary Clinton, longtime Democratic leader Donna Brazile is blasting her own party for what she says are failings on just about every level, from campaign management to Russia to a flawed candidate and a doomed campaign she tried in vain, she writes, to save. This morning, new bombshell allegations from DNC interim chair Donna Brazile, revealing she thought about dropping Hillary Clinton from the 2016 Democratic ticket. In excerpts from her new memoir released by The Washington Post, Brazile says she seriously considered party insiders' suggestions to put someone else on the ticket after Clinton fainted at a 9-11 event just two months before the election. Again and again, I thought about Joe Biden, Brazil writes, but considering the historical importance of a female candidate, I could not make good on that threat to replace her. Other shocking allegations include secret deals with the DNC and fundraising funneled to Clinton at Bernie Sanders' expense. Brazil contends the anemic Clinton campaign cut a deal with former DNC chair Debbie Wasserman Schultz to control its pocketbook. This was not a criminal act, she writes, but as I saw it, it compromised the party's integrity. These new allegations are now giving President Trump fuel to attack. President tweeting on Friday, Brazil just stated the DNC rigged the system to illegally steal the primary, bought and paid for by Crooked H. This is real collusion and dishonesty. Brazil tweeting back with the hashtag, not what I said. In a clip released on social media, the president telling Cheryl Atkinson this in an interview airing today on Full Measure. But uh, what happened to Bernie Sanders with the DNC, uh, spearheaded by the Clintons, and according to the new book by Donna Brazile, was horrible. We have heard from top staffers from the Clinton campaign. They responded to Brazil in a lengthy post. They say they are shocked at her allegations, and they do not recognize the campaign she describes in her book. Dan, Diane. Gloria, thank you. Let's bring in our chief anchor, George Stephanopoulos, who will be hosting this week a little later this morning. I bet Donna never thought she'd have uh, President Trump promoting her book so aggressively. No, but she'll be our first guest on this week this morning. Yeah, so let's talk about some of the allegations and revelations in her book. Does she, did she have the power as chair of the DNC to actually remove Hillary Clinton from the top of the ticket? And, and I guess more broadly, what does this whole story say about the state of the Democratic Party? Well, number one, not on her own. She didn't have the power to replace Hillary Clinton on her own. Sorry, my earpiece is falling out <laughs> right there. Um, she did, she would have had the, the ability to get that process in motion, to consult with other leaders in the party and ultimately kick it over to the DNC. But as she actually also says in the book, she didn't actually move that process along, but had this period of about a day where she was openly, in, well, not openly, but speculating in her own mind, musing about who would be the best ticket to replace uh, Hillary Clinton and Tim Kaine. And she came upon the idea that it would be Joe Biden and Cory Booker. She says in the book that she believes they would have won the election. Mm. And, what, and, and about the state of the Democratic Party? Well, you see it in the, re in the reaction to Donna's book as well. It is a divided party. Uh, right now between the establishment and the grassroots. There's a lot of there are a lot of second guessing and recriminations over last year's campaign. A lot of most Democrats believe that was a campaign that should have won, that was supposed to win. They'll also say it got the popular vote but didn't didn't get enough in the Electoral College. But yeah, right now the Democratic Party has been hollowed out. Uh, under Barack Obama, and there's a lot of nervousness ahead of these elections coming up on Tuesday, especially the Virginia governor's election, which is very close right now. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what, if any, change comes about as a result of the revelations in this book. But I want to get to the new poll that we mentioned at the top of the show. You know, beyond these historically low approval ratings, the majority of respondents are also saying that they don't think Trump has the right of uh, temperament to be president. They say he's not honest, he's not empathetic, he's not a good deal maker, he's not an effective leader, and yet his base seems to be holding. Why do you think that is? A few reasons for that. Number one, we're becoming a more partisan country. People tend to pick a team and stick with it. Mm -hmm. uh, but even more than that, the president has focused all of his attention, all of his political attention, on cultivating uh, that base. Now, that said, 
37 percent is is historically low as our poll says no other president in modern times has ever had poll numbers like that and you have to remember he's got poll numbers that low at a time when the economy is basically booming four percent unemployment record highs in the stock market i think the big concern for the president has to be what will happen if there's any kind of an economic downturn will the bottom just completely fall out mm -hmm. George, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. And I want to remind everybody, George has a big show this morning. He will, as mentioned, be speaking with the former DNC chair, Donna Brazile, about those bombshells in her new book. Plus, House Freedom Caucus chair, Congressman Mark Meadows, and Congressman Peter King will weigh in on the Republican tax plan that's coming up on this week right here on ABC. George, thanks again. Appreciate it. Thanks, George. And speaking of Republicans in Congress, a wild story involving Kentucky Senator Rand Paul, who is recovering this morning after being attacked at his home. A spokesman says the senator was blocked blindsided in this assault and the FBI is now investigating. ABC's Kenneth Moten is in Washington with the latest. Kenneth, good morning. Good morning, Dan and Diane. Senator Rand Paul, no stranger to political <laughs> fights here in Washington, but he likely was not expecting a physical altercation in his front yard. Here's what we know. The junior senator from Kentucky says a neighbor tackled him from behind on his property in Warren County. Reportedly, while the senator was mowing his lawn, he didn't even see it coming. A police report says Paul was knocked to the ground the impact causing injuries to his face and possibly his ribs since he had trouble breathing. Paul was checked out by a doctor after his office said he was, quote, blindsided. But a spokeswoman said Senator Paul is fine. State police say that neighbor, 59-year-old Rene Bouchard, who was arrested and charged with fourth-degree assault. This morning, no details on what this violent encounter was about or if it was politically motivated. There have been a number of security concerns from members of Congress, lawmakers on both sides of the aisle reporting threats in the wake of that shooting at a GOP congressional baseball practice a few months ago. Rand Paul, outspoken, a fierce critic of the Affordable Care Act, and recently a defender of President Trump's policies. This morning, the FBI says it's aware of the attack and is working to figure out if any federal laws were broken. Diane and Dan. Glad the senator is doing okay this morning. Kenneth, thank you. We move now to Florida, where an FSU fraternity finds itself suspended this morning as police investigate the death of a pledge. Police say the 20-year-old died after a party. ABC's Eva Pilgrim joins us now with more. Good morning, Eva. Good morning. Another college frat party turns fatal. A pledge found dead, this time at Florida State. It's once again raising some tough questions about Greek life, alcohol, and hazing. This morning, a Florida State University fraternity shut down. A pledge found dead after a night of partying. Unfortunately, when medical emergency personnel got here, along with TPD, they determined the person to be deceased. All attempts to revive the person were unsuccessful. Authorities confirmed the Pi Kappa Phi fraternity threw an off-campus house party here Thursday night. 10.30 Friday morning, the brothers call for help. Police find 20-year-old Andrew Coffey dead inside the home. The cause? Still under investigation. The National Pie Cap Office suspending the fraternity at Florida State. FSU's vice president waiting on more details about the death, releasing a statement saying, we will work closely with the Tallahassee Police Department as it investigates to determine the facts surrounding this case. This incident, the latest in a string of tragedies to hit the Greek community. Just last week, prosecutors refiling previously dismissed charges against some Beta Theta Pi brothers at Penn State for the death of a pledge there. 19-year-old Timothy Piazza was found unconscious after apparently falling head first down a flight of stairs after what authorities are calling an alcohol-fueled hazing ritual. Nobody should go through this. Investigators say the brothers waited 12 hours before calling 911. None of the brothers have entered pleas on the new charges. And less than a month ago in Louisiana, the brothers of Phi Delta Theta led away in handcuffs after the hazing death of freshman pledge Max Groover. A coroner's report saying that Groover's blood alcohol level was 0.495, six times the legal driving limit, well past the amount considered deadly. In the last five years, the pie caps at FSU have been reprimanded three times for hazing, alcohol, and conduct violations. Each time, either the university imposed sanctions or the national office put the fraternity through a remedial action plan. Still a lot of questions about what the cause of death was. And the overall questions about Greek life on campus in this country. Eva, thank you. Appreciate it.
All right, we want to take a look here in New York City at our own backyard because security is tighter than ever this morning for the marathon. The city and state going all out, they say, to ensure the safety of the 50,000 plus runners and millions of spectators just days after that deadly terror attack in lower Manhattan. ABC's Ariel Reshef is right there at the finish line in Central Park. Ariel, good morning to you. Good morning, Dan and Diane. Law enforcement is on high alert after the terror attack earlier this week. Here at the finish line, canine officers and a heavy police presence, all part of a massive show of force across the city. Runners taking their marks for the New York City Marathon under unprecedented security. Less than one week after the deadliest terror attack in the city since 9-11. This year we're going to be taking extra precautions for obvious reasons, and we're going to be taking those extra precautions all across the system. Nearly triple the number of law enforcement personnel keeping a close eye on key sites along the 26-mile route. Heavily armed counterterrorism units, canine officers and snipers spread across the city. Authorities patrolling public transportation, bridges, tunnels and airports. We're going through every possibility. The added measures coming after the deadly bike path terror rampage that killed eight people in lower Manhattan. More than 51,000 runners undeterred. Millions expected to flood the city to cheer them on. New Yorkers are resilient and you know I think they love to make statements and this is a way to make a statement to come together and show the world that we don't hide. The governor says there is no specific threat to the marathon and all of the added security measures are out of an abundance of caution. Dan, Diane. Ariel, thank you very much. Best of luck to all the runners and spectators today. Let's get it over to Rob with a look at the weather this morning. Hey, Rob. Good morning, guys. Uh, weather for the marathon, pretty good, actually. Heavy rain last night, now moving out. Uh, you saw what Ariel was wearing, uh, just a, a light jacket, kind of cool and damp, uh, and mostly a crosswind through the day. So if you can run 26 miles, not a bad environment to do that. I can't for one. We are watching this system, which is going to be pressing across the uh, eastern Corn Belt, the Great Lakes, and we've got some upper level, level energy with this to the point where I think we're going to see some uh, strong uh, thunderstorms, and the SBC has this area out highlighted for strong winds, large hail, potentially even some uh, tornadoes from just south of St. Louis up north of Evansville, riding along the Ohio River in the south of Indianapolis, and, and a lot of these are going to come. You see 7 o'clock tonight, 5, 6, 7 o'clock by 5 in most areas. It's already dark, so these could be dangerous storms that start to pop uh, when, we, when we're in the dark. Meanwhile, flash flood watch in effect for this area because we've already seen some rain. We'll see another two to three inches of rainfall on top of that as these storms continue to develop today. And it will be hot again across the south. That's the latest check on the weather headlines across the country. It's time now for your local forecast. Waking up to temperatures in the 40s to 50s, certainly above average for this time of year, and that's how we'll remain for today. Temperature topping out into the mid to upper 60s. Unfortunately, mostly cloudy skies and some areas of drizzle to kick things off for your Sunday. As we head into the overnight hours, mostly cloudy skies and waking up to some areas of patchy fog. But into the early half of the week, tracking a cold front, some heavier rainfall by Monday afternoon and some thunderstorms as well. We fall cooler by Tuesday. You didn't watch yesterday. I got <laughs> wardrobe harassment from my brown suit, which I'm wearing again today. <laughs> the same suit? Two yeah. brown suits. The exact no, same, same suit. Same I, suit. May, I may wear it for the entire month of November. Okay, brown suit and the brown tie. He doubled down. You, you I love it. Did. I strongly support you. Just so you know. Yeah. Oh, whoa! whoa. Good good weather for brown tie, I think you know what? It was the extra hour of sleep. That's yeah, why. Yeah, yeah. There you go. I'm every week. Chocolate suit. Chocolatey suit. Anyway. Let's uh, check in with Ron. News? Willy Wonka. Any chocolate right. in the news today? Again. Uh, yeah, we have some breaking news actually out of uh, Saudi Arabia this morning where it has been reported that dozens of members of the royal family as well as former government ministers were arrested overnight in a new sweeping anti-corruption campaign. The surprise raids being called a show of force by the crown prince there. And in a separate incident Saturday, Saudi Arabian forces reported that they intercepted a ballistic missile fired by rebels from Yemen that was headed toward one of the country's major airports near the capital, Riyadh. In Illinois, an officer with the Rockford, Illinois Police Department has died after he was shot during a traffic stop early this morning. He had been with the department only for one year. Officers responding to the scene where that officer was shot found a crashed car about two blocks away. The person inside of that car was dead. And in Kentucky, uh, Governor Matt Bevan is calling for any public official or state employee who has ever settled a sexual harassment suit to resign immediately. This as Kentucky House Speaker Jeff Hoover uh, is under investigation for allegedly trying to hide sexual harassment uh, claims made against him. 
He says he has no plans to resign. Three other state legislators reportedly settled sexual harassment uh, complaints just last month. In Zimbabwe, a court has upheld charges against an American woman accused of plotting to overthrow the government. 25-year-old uh, Martha O'Donovan was arrested after she reportedly called the country's president, quote, 